Hi, I'm Monica Embers, and I'm going to discuss uh, the impact of immune responses on successful diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease. The learning objectives for this module are to provide a general overview of immune evasion and suppression by the Lyme disease spirochete, to describe current diagnostic tests and how variable responses to infection may affect their accuracy, and finally, to review antibiotic treatment mechanisms and new research showing how immune response may affect treatment outcome. So uh, the overview that I'll be presenting, will start with persistent infection in reservoir and incidental hosts. Uh, we'll talk about immune evasion strategies used by the spirochete. I'll discuss some landmark studies on immune suppression by Borrelia, provide an overview of diagnostic test modalities, describe some findings on variability of antibody responses, and finally uh, discuss treatment success and its correlation with immune responses. So Borrelia burgdorferi uh, persists in both its reservoir and incidental hosts. In nature, the white-footed mouse is the primary uh, reservoir natural host for uh, the Lyme disease spirochetes. And we know that mice fail to clear the infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. This is because survival of the pathogen through the enzootic cycle requires the ability of them to proliferate with minimal host immunity. Both primate, pr primates, both human and non-human, appear to harbor a low-level persistent infection, and we would be considered incidental hosts. So the immune, immune evasion tactics that are used by the spirochetes contribute to persistence in the incidental hosts as well. We don't necessarily know to what extent. Uh, but clearly, uh, some of these factors come into play uh, with human Lyme disease. So uh, Borrelia spirochetes are able to evade the host immune response in many different ways. Let's start with immune evasion. So we know that they can engage in physical seclusion, and we know that they can engage in both phase and antigenic variation. Uh, there is a variable expression of antigens throughout the course of infection. There is um, uh, an antigen called VLSE that engages in gene conversion and mutation and recombination. So it outruns the antibody response effectively. And then we also know that Borrelia can engage in active immune suppression. We know that they, there are many different proteins that inhibit complement. We know that they can induce anti-inflammatory cytokines, tolerize monocytes, and uh, possibly sequester uh, antibodies in immune complexes. So this is uh, just a seminal article showing the impact of IL-10. And IL-10 is a potent uh, anti-inflammatory cytokine. And when uh, macrophages or dendritic cells are presented with Borrelia, they produce high levels of IL-10. But in the absence of IL-10, such as in IL-10 knockout mice, uh, levels of IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-12 are all elevated. So this would recruit other uh, cells to the site of infection. And by, by inducing IL-10, Borrelia has the ability to dampen that. So not only do the spirochetes engage in immune evasion and suppression, but the ticks that transmit them also help them to evade the host immune response. There are a number of different tick proteins which have been shown to inhibit various facets of the immune response, including CD4 T cells, dendritic cells, um, macrophages, and even B cells. So what I'd like to discuss today are the diagnosis, some, some studies we've done with the diagnosis of Lyme disease and variability in the immune response, studies on the treatment of Lyme disease, and how Borrelia affects the immune response to the detriment of both accurate diagnosis and effective treatment. So the CDC case definition of Lyme disease is either an erythema migrans rash of five centimeters in diameter or more, and at least one late manifestation, which could be musculoskeletal, nervous, or cardiovascular, and laboratory confirmation. So the laboratory criteria for diagnosis include at least one of the following, 
Uh, first, isolation of Borrelia burgdorferi. We know it's short-lived in the bloodstream for a narrow, narrow window of time, and it's very hard to get culture positive from, from blood. Uh, demonstration of high of di uh, diagnostic levels of IgM or IgG to Borrelia. We know that this is highly variable and a significant increase in antibody titer between acute and convalescent samples. We also know that this is highly variable and it depends on which antigens are used for the test. So two-tiered testing for Lyme disease is the gold standard. The first test is typically in ELISA. And if there is a positive or equivocal result, it's followed up by a Western blot. If signs or symptoms have occurred for less than 30 days in IgM and IgG Western blot, and if they've uh, been present for greater than 30 days, just an IgG Western blot. Ironically, we know that IgM also persists, so they should probably uh, perform both. So some of the evidence that I'm going to present about the variation and suppression of B cell responses comes from both primates and mice. We're going to look at antibody responses after experimental infection in primates and uh, overview uh, a study in mice where vaccination after Borrelia burgdorferi was performed as an indicator of the immune response. So uh, many years ago, I had this question of how the immune response changes over the course of infection and after treatment. So we performed a longitud longitudinal assessment of antibody responses to many different diagnostic antigens following experimental infection and treatment. We had the goal in mind to identify a combination of antigens that could indicate infection at all phases of disease and the response to antibiotic treatment. So what you're looking at here are the antibody responses of five rhesus macaques that were infected with Borrelia burgdorferi to four different antigens, C6, OSPC, DBPA, and OPPA2. Those with red lines were treated with doxycycline at four months post-infection, and those in blue were untreated. As you can see, the animals treated with doxycycline showed a decline in, in C6 titer over time, which was expected. Um, and this has been proposed as an indicator of treatment outcome. Whereas those who had not been treated had a, a persistent uh, C6 responses. And we know that uh, non-human primates, probably in humans as well, uh, this can either stay high or decline over time. When we looked at OSPC responses, we found that they come up very early and they decline over time, irrespective of treatment. When we looked at DBPA responses, we found that they come up um, very high and stay high throughout the course of infection. And we looked at anti-OPPA2 responses. We saw that they do decline after treatment, but incompletely. The reason that we wanted to look at this antigen is because in a study of antibiotic efficacy in mice, uh, transcripts to OSPA, OPPA2 were produced by the persisting, persisting organisms. And we wanted to test if it was in, antigenic and could be used as an indicator of persistent infection. So we published this paper and um, indicated that uh, five different antigens could be used uh, in a combination at, for a diagnostic test. So the goal is to uh, use a Luminex-based platform. Uh, we run this in the lab all the time now. Um, these are cytometric beads coded with the antigen of interest. Uh, we have different colors and different antigens. And then uh, we pass the serum over, wash it, and then um, come with a secondary antibody. And this is not only qualitative, but quantitative. And we can measure the response to multiple antigens at a single time with uh, basically a microliter of serum. So uh, we performed a study in non-human primates where we inoculated them by tick because the immune responses will be different if they're inoculated by needle or by tick. So after tick-mediated infection, we looked at how uh, the antibody responses changed over time and after a 28-day course of treatment. Shown here on the left panel are five untreated macaques and on the right are five treated macaques. Probably the first thing you will notice is that uh, one of the animals 
uh, did not have a serological response. So these lines are the uh, antibody levels over time to five different antigens. So this animal was seronegative. This animal developed uh, responses to two of the antigens, uh, which declined over time. It turns out that this animal was definitely persistently infected. Uh, we have evidence from xenodiagnostic ticks and direct evidence from tissues. And this animal um, did not have any pathology, uh, so we think it may have self-cured. So we know that the, the antibody responses in non-human primates are um, reflective, are, are highly variable, and they, there can be seronegative uh, persistently infected animals. So next I'd like to talk about a study in mice um, which dem demonstrate immune suppression. So this was an experiment to determine the suppression of humoral immunity to an unrelated antigen. So this is a vaccine derived from flu. Um, there are two cohorts of mice, one that was infected with Borrelia and given this flu vaccine, and another that was not infected with Borrelia and given the vaccine. Uh, the researchers wanted to follow antigen-specific T cell responses, so they gave the mice uh, transgenic CD4 T cells specific for this APR8 hemagglutinin and peptide. So they also looked not only for um, T cell activation, but also uh, the, the um, antibody secreting cells in both the blood and bone marrow. And the first thing you'll probably notice is that um, there wasn't much difference in terms of the uh, the specific antibody secreting cells, the isotypes of the antibody secreting cells. However, when you compare the mice that were infected with Borrelia shown here with those that were not infected, those that were not infected generated very good IgG responses to the flu vaccine and those infected did not. And when you look at the antibody secreting cells, there's a significant difference between the Borrelia infected and the flu, um, flu only. However, big changes uh, between the T cell responses were not noted. So there's also been a correlation between antibody responses and treatment outcome in humans. Um, we looked at antibody responses among Lyme patients and their response to treatment. And uh, another group also looked at the plasma blasts and cured patients versus those with post-treatment Lyme disease. So post-treatment Lyme disease uh, is the uh, occurrence of continued symptoms after the recommended course of, of antibiotic treatment. And it could be caused by the induction of inflammatory responses by lingering dead spirochetes or antigen. It could be caused by continuation of active spirochetal infection, or it could be caused by an autoimmune uh, mechanism, which would be irreversible sequela from a previous active infection. These may all be playing in concert as well. So, we looked at um, our antibody-based test, our five antigen multiplex test, and we compared it to the C6 peptide ELISA, which is commonly used to diagnose Lyme disease, um, in, in a cohort of well-characterized Lyme patients from the CDC. Secondly, we also tested patients who had uh, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome from this study uh, performed by John Al. Cott's lab, where he found that 11% of patients who were treated early uh, with a recommended course of doxycycline continued to have clinical symptoms and functional decline, whereas most of the other patients uh, did not have residual, uh, residual uh, symptoms. So beginning with the patients uh, from the CDC cohort, these are all well characterized, and we also looked at uh, look-alike diseases. So each um, label on the x-axis is a series of bars 
And you can see here that um, those that are in bold are Lyme disease patients. And those that are not bold are uh, either healthy non-endemic controls or healthy endemic controls or lookalike diseases like syphilis, um, mononucleosis, periodontitis, MS, fibromyalgia, et cetera. So uh, we did a little bit better than uh, two-tier testing in the early acute phase where we picked up one patient that was not positive. And for all the other patient groups, we were 100% um, in picking up the infection or the exposure. So uh, I'd like to draw your attention to this patient here that had Lyme arthritis and responded to, uh, here we only have four antigens shown, but responded well to all four antigens. Uh, and that'll come into play at the, in the next slide. So when we compared our five antigen multiplex IgG test to ELISA, two-tier, and C6, uh, we found that we got 79.5% sensitivity and 91.7% specificity compared the 60, to the 61% sensitivity of two-tier and the 77% sensitivity of C6. So next, we looked at these patients from the, uh, the Hopkins group. And here you see in green, 10 patients who uh, returned to health after treatment, 10 patients in white who had residual less severe symptoms, and 10 patients in blue who had post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And my hypothesis was that the patients who had post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome would have lingering antibody responses because they have a persistent infection. However, we found the opposite. What we found is that those who returned to health had much better antibody responses to begin with. And so when you look at these percentages and the positivity rate, it's compared to that Lyme arthritis patient that responded to all five antigens. And you can see uh, that the healthy category generated antibody responses to multiple antigens, and the PTLDS category generated weak responses to all antigens, with the exception of OPPA2. So our conclusion from this was that nine of 10 patients that returned to health generated strong IgG responses to two or more antigens in our assay. And all patients categorized as having post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome either showed weak responses to all antigens or produce an anti-OPPA titer that did not decline. And these results were corroborated by a group at Stanford. So what they did was they looked at plasma blasts or the percentage of B cells producing, activated and producing antibodies. And uh, these are the two patient categories. So those patients that developed post-treatment Lyme disease or persistent symptoms had very few plasma blasts compared to those who returned to health. So this is consistent with good immune responses, boding well for good responses to uh, antibiotic treatment. So uh, it seems that host antibody responses appear to be predictive of clinical cure. And we know that the commonly used antibiotics don't kill the pathogen, especially doxycycline. So some possible explanations for the weak responses, there could be host differences in the ability to generate humoral responses to Borrelia, um, possibly an isotype switching. And there also could be strain differences uh, among Borrelia and co-infections co could influence host immunity as well. So in summary, the gold standard diagnostic test detects antibodies to Borrelia burgdorferi. Responses to infection vary significantly among individuals and change over time. Currently, the most common recommended antibiotic is microbiostatic and relies on a good immune response to clear the infection. More research is certainly needed, but several studies indicate that the humoral response to infection correlates with a good treatment outcome. And Borrelia can manipulate the antibody response and the ability to do that could depend on Borrelia strains, strain differences and host factors. This also deserves further investigation. And finally, I'd just like to share with you a research highlight. Uh, we have been using combinations of antibiotics in, in the lab 
And we know that this has the potential to target all morphological forms and phenotypes of Borrelia. So studies in animals indicate that several triple drug combinations are superior to doxycycline in the ability to eradicate infection. This is possibly analogous to uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, where multiple antibiotics using different mechanisms are used to treat the infection. Thank you.